Have you ever felt frustrated when you express your deepest, most tender feelings to a partner and maybe you even utter to them for the first time, you know, I love you. And instead of them taking you into their arms and saying it back, they kind of arch their eyebrows and emotionally pull away. Or maybe they offer no explanation or maybe they mutter something like, you know, you're just in love with the idea of being in love. I think this really has nothing to do with me. And so as a result, you might find yourself wondering, how could you ever possibly express your love so that your partner is able to receive it and you? And then really wanting to know the exact words and actions that you would need to say and take in order to feel as connected to them as you would like to be. Well, if this sounds familiar, you're not alone in that. In my online community, individuals often share posts and comments expressing these very same thoughts and feelings and experiences. So most recently, this question came up, how can I make my avoidant partner recognize our love? And another member said, would saying I love you reassure an avoidant partner and bring them closer? And so I invite you to stick around for this, zip, this video segment because in this segment, I'm gonna talk about three steps to finding what I call the divine lesson in attracting a partner like this and how to approach whatever the next steps might be in love. So make sure you stick around. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Brianna McWilliam and I am a licensed and board certified creative arts therapist, author, and educator. With more than 15 years in the field, helping adults struggling with insecure attachment go from self-doubting to self-sovereign so they can attract those soul-shaking, passionate partnerships that they want. Today, I'm going to be sharing a clip of a live stream event that took place inside my private Facebook groups, which people can access once they've purchased one of my online courses. If you're interested in finding out if you might have insecure attachment, check out the link in the caption of this video. You'll be able to take an easy four question quiz and find out your attachment style plus a detailed explanation. Now, if you like what you see in here and you haven't yet, make sure that you like, subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. I put up videos once or twice a week and sometimes I will do occasional live streams through my YouTube channel and I wouldn't want you to miss out. Now to begin, I wanna start by repeating the question. How can I make my avoidant partner recognize our love? Would saying I love you reassure an avoidant partner and bring them closer? Now, before addressing any machinations we might want to enact in the external world, the first thing I would do is I would recommend that you accept the premise that the external world, including your partners in it, are usually reflecting something back to you about you. So they are embodying an aspect of you that is seeking integration or acknowledgement. And so it calls into your external experience someone that will challenge your accepted notions about yourself well enough that you will finally pay attention to what is going on inside you. So in a nutshell, partners that appear to operate in the opposite way that you would on the outside are a clever way that the universe gifts you a spiritual mirror of self-discovery. So for example, while anxious open hearts love to hear things like, I love you, for Rolling Stones, these statements can be laden with negative connotations and assumptions. So an avoidant Rolling Stone partner may have had the experience of words meaning very little or of words, especially like, I love you, being used as tools of emotional manipulation with very little action to back them up. Now, I know many a Rolling Stone who would say, you're not in love with me. You're in love with the idea of being in love. And if you truly love a Rolling Stone, the best way to say it is through patience, consistent action, honoring your own boundaries, being a relatively independent person, and using your words to articulate something that you notice about them specifically and individually. I would not use generic terms like I love you, which for them is often meaningless at best or triggering offensive and a turnoff at worst. Now this might sound a little harsh or confusing, but I would have you consider just for a moment, are you really in love with the idea of being in love? Why are you drawn to someone that is so independently oriented with wounds around the subject? Are you trying to save them? What will that prove to you about yourself? What wounds are you carrying around unacknowledged? Now, again, I recommend that you accept the premise that the external world, including your partners in it, are usually reflecting something back to you about you. And so to change anything in the external world, you have to start with your internal world. Now, most people can't start there. 
we are too conditioned to be preoccupied with the external world to really see any kind of internal process at first. So we're going to roll with that before we tackle step number one or in order to tackle step number one. And that is step, step number one. Ask yourself, what are you wanting from the external world of form? How do you think that having that thing is going to make you feel? And what does that idea gratify for you on a deeper level? So someone who might ask the questions that I just posed might say something like, I want to be with my soulmate because then I can finally start living my life in the way that I always dreamed. I think this person is my soulmate because I feel so good and when I'm with them, I believe I can't feel that way in any other circumstance and I can't be my fullest self without this person. Now, it is often the case, particularly with individuals that are emotionally perceptive and intelligent, like an anxious open heart, that you may see a certain inner dynamic or struggle going on in your partner, which they are as yet unaware of or unwilling to acknowledge because for whatever reason, they're not ready to. And in fact, they may never be ready to. And perhaps that is their purpose among the collective. And you being a lighted being and wanting to share that love and connection, you root for the side of that struggle, which, if it were to win out, would lead to an expanding love between you both. You identify that part of them as their truth, the truth of their beingness. And this isn't necessarily wrong from a certain point of view. But you're also ignoring that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. And you're neglecting the fact that they have a relationship to their own inner conflict that may be serving them in ways that don't necessarily serve you or what you think you want beyond helping you to recognize what it is that you truly want. So there is a softness around this initially, a kind of receptive witnessing. And that is your strength and your gift. And if you have a partner that is willing to receive that, then the growth potential is unlimited. But if your partner persists in a disconnection from themselves, for whatever reason it might serve them, now your ego and your physical attachment system feels threatened and you feel triggered. And that means there is a lesson in their inner conflict that is meant to be a mirror for you to learn something more about yourself in the butting up against them. So for example, if your psychic and emotional boundaries have fallen because you don't know how to be loving and compassionate without abandoning yourself entirely, then you absorb their disconnection from themselves and now you feel disconnected from yourself in addition to feeling disconnected from them. So you're disconnected from your own source energy or let's call it spirit. And that's because you've primarily been using that person as a point of focus or a conduit for having access to yourself. And we all do this. It's not a judgment or an accusation. It's just one very dominant way in which we've been trained to relate to people. And this is not to suggest that we should never, ever, ever do that. But it is a way in which we've been taught to do primarily. And that becomes an issue when you encounter things like heartbreak or being with an incompatible partner. So for example, let's say a heterosexual couple has been dating for a while and Tom is still in sporadic contact with his ex, we'll call her Kim, and they maintain a friendship. And their relationship ended a long time ago and Tom claims that they are still only genuinely platonic feelings between them. Now let's say Jane is Tom's current girlfriend and for the most part, she's not really bothered by that friendship. Kim lives in another state anyway, and they only see each other maybe once a year. But every time Tom gets on the phone with Kim, his ex, Jane gets into the sense that Kim is relying on Tom for emotional comfort and support. And Tom likes to play the role of rescuer, and he's gratified by Kim's neediness. This irritates Jane, and it makes her feel envious and jealous. She also slips into comparing herself to Kim, who is a rather attractive and successful woman. And so many people remain on the surface when analyzing a situation like this. They jump to assumptions about the meaning of these interactions. Oh, they must still carry a flame for each other. He's still holding on to all his options and struggling with FOMO. She's just waiting for a conflict in the relationship to get him back. He's trying to triangulate the situation and gaslight Jane. Or maybe they're just friends and Jane is overly sensitive and insecure. Blah, 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 blah. Right? Well... Let's say that Jane is a bit insecure, but she's also very emotionally intelligent and perceptive. And her understanding of Tom's rescuer tendencies is tipping her off to something emotionally important. 
not only for understanding the nature of their relationship, but also for Jane understanding her own nature. Because when someone has rescuer tendencies, they typically are validation seeking and they seek it from the outside world and they want and like to be needed, to be relied upon. That does gratify them. And so there is a need to be needed and validated. And so Tom's needs to be needed and validated are what's actually getting under James' skin. And when that happens, he becomes subject to external conditions, specifically, potentially, subject to the seduction of a beautiful woman crying on his shoulder asking for comfort. And while Tom comforts Kim and gratifies his need to be needed and validated, Jane senses the risk involved and becomes increasingly jealous and envious as a defensive response because this is her very same crutch. In sensing Tom's insecurity, his need for external validation and attention, she feels her own need to be the sole recipient of his attention and validation. Why aren't I enough? She asks herself. And while she is simmering in this not enough feeling, Tom is chatting with Kim, attempting to band-aid his own not enough feeling. And so Tom and Jane are really a perfect vibrational match for each other. But now Jane's feelings become sharp and hard and inflexible, and maybe she falls back on mechanisms of control to find relief from the anxiety that this creates. Then in addition to seeing, understanding, and empathizing with the inner struggle she witnesses in Tom, she heaps on top of it all these agendas and action plans for how she thinks that they should behave to improve the reestablishment of their connection to each other, which might make it easier for her to reestablish a connection to herself. And also, it leads us to down this road of slipping into believing a rather damaging myth that we tend to perpetuate in relationships, which is that understanding leads to agreement. And so it sounds something kind of like this. I want my partner to see what I see and to do what I think would be best, because I think if they really understood my perspective, then they would agree with my perspective. And that will make us more deeply connected in the ways that feel good to me. And so my assertion of this perspective onto them, onto the notion of truth itself, is really for their own good. Whatever they are experiencing is just old baggage getting in the way. It's not the truth of our experience here in this moment. Now, I would also add that this perspective is probably the perspective of your partner as well, but from their side of the fence, which is why you both are most likely attracted to each other, but also butting heads. So that's the first step recognizing what it is that you are looking for in the external world and understanding that as a mirror for your own internal vibe, let's say. Now, now the second step is to take a look at what are the false premises and limiting beliefs that lie beneath this desire. So when you say something like, why can't they see the truth of our love? Why can't they understand that this just is the way it is? You basically confirm that it is not the way it is, not entirely because you are identifying a contradiction, a contrast, a boundary line, a disagreement, and a truth by its very nature. Because truth by its very nature is the absence of disagreement. So truth is what it is, <laughs> because it's, you know, rightness is agreed upon by all involved. But when your partner sees something different than you, then this truth is called into question. And when they see something different, you start assigning an intention to that. Oh, they just don't want to see. And it's like wagging a finger at a petulant child. This kind of assignment of intention serves to buttress your perspective as truth, the truth, and as being in the right about every version of things. And if people don't want to accept it, then they're just being difficult. They're misbehaving. They're not expanding. They're not fulfilling their potential. But the truth is that you see one thing and they see something else. You're motivated by one desire and they're motivated by another. So the truth is that there's a conflict. There's a contradiction. There's a contrast. There's something that does not quite fit. There is something that separates you. And this is only intolerable when we haven't quite learned how to allow for the possibility of multiple realities or creative solutions. That's the truth. The truth, such as it stands, is that you both disagree about something, and it's likely to be something important, or you wouldn't be asking about how to deal with it. So you might sense that maybe someone has strong feelings for you, an avoidant partner, let's say, and you see that those strong feelings 
you see that as their truth, but maybe they don't acknowledge those feelings within themselves, or maybe they refuse to label it out loud, or maybe they don't want to commit to it. In essence, they don't prioritize that feeling in the same way that you do. But that lack of prioritization, you determine, well, that must be the lie, you say. But each part is an equal truth. Their loving feelings, it is a piece of the pie, but it's not the whole pie. The whole truth might be that they are not willing to take action on it. The whole truth might be that you are ready for something that they are not, that were, <laughs> or that you are trying to be ready for something that they are not. But if you cling to someone that is not ready, then you're really not ready either because now there's something that you are also refusing to acknowledge in your emotional reality as well. And that is why you're both together here in this moment in this relationship because as I said before, it's likely you're a perfect vibrational match. So when we focus upon one sliver of truth and we call it the whole of reality, we make everything and everyone else wrong and we turn it into a villain. We turn it into a lie. And you take one slice of the pie and you deny the fact that there are five slices left. They can rot for all you care. And so those extra slices get mad and they feel rejected and dismissed by you and they armor up and they refuse to be ignored. And then the inner and the outer conflict increases in your relationship and your partner gets increasingly irritated with you and pushes you away even more because you're not willing to see and eat all their slices, only the one slice that fits your mold. And yet here you are trying to hog the whole pie. So how do you deal with that? Well, a lot of us crawl into a hole and cry ourselves to sleep every night because unless we're willing to open up and take a 360 degree look at what is actually going on around us, we're not going to be able to navigate our way through it. And so this is another metaphor. If you've lost your keys in a parking lot and night has fallen, don't only look wherever the street lamp shines, especially if you've dropped your keys in the shadows because otherwise you're never going to find them. So don't only look wherever it is that you want to look, where it's easiest to look, where everyone else is telling you to look, even where your partner may want you to focus your attention. Look at the whole picture and you are always a part of it. And when we start claiming that our perception of things is the way things are to the exclusion of other people's realities, that's when we start dismissing and invalidating other people's experiences in search of validation. And we start clinging to things like potential right? We start calling potential the truth, but it's not the truth. It's called potential because it doesn't exist in physical form yet. And everything has potential. Of course it does. Everything stems from source. Everything is an experiment. The potential might even be a grand and great idea, but chasing down a good idea that cannot be executed is actually a bad idea because it keeps you running in circles. It drains your energy and resources, and it is nowhere near the truth not of your relationship, though it could be a reflection of what you want the relationship to be. And that is what makes it such valuable information because now you can start to extract the essence of what you really desire from an ego attachment and a preoccupation with the idea that it has to be with this person who perhaps reflects back to you again, a slice of that pie that you want, but you're just refusing to eat the whole thing. So rather than say to yourself, oh, I must be so stupid for attracting this person or for being attracted to this person because look at all those other five slices I don't like. You might try saying to yourself, wow, my attractive energy must be really expanding because look at this pie. It has one whole slice that relates to exactly what I want, a slice that I did not have before. I did that. I attracted that and I cultivated it. And now I know what it's like to experience a slice of what I want. And that gave me an idea of what more might be out there. All right, universe, you're on. I'm game. I see this can really work in my favor because I'm discerning. I recognize that holding on to these extra slices that I don't like and I won't eat doesn't serve me or the pie because maybe there's someone else out there that likes this flavor just fine. And if there's one pie with at least one slice for me out there, the odds are pretty great that there are even more pies with more slices that I would be willing to eat. But giving me this pie now... That builds trust between you and me, universe. So I'm going to pass this on and leave my plate open and ready for my next course because who knows? With my luck, maybe a whole ice cream sundae is going to show up next. Now, the inability to do this originates from attachment impulses of the physical body. And then the ego attaches stories to those sensations to justify why we are yearning so deeply which is primarily based on survival fears of the nervous system and the limbic brain in combination with our social conditioning. 
And if you want to learn more about that and the body's role in informing the way we form these ego attachments, I invite you to check out a video of mine on YouTube. It's called Ego Attachment Versus Attachment Theory. And I have another one that we recorded last month called Trigger Mapping and Your Window of Tolerance, if you want to learn more about that. Now, the third step. And I know this is a long segment, but I really wanted to get into this because I think it affects a lot of the questions people are asking. The, thir the third step is to identify and adopt a new belief system that includes building a reframing bridge. And what I just articulated is an example of a reframing bridge and a statement to help you see the possibilities of love in the world for you. So let's just for a moment say that you are willing to accept what I'm saying. How do you deal with it then? So would you sink into an acceptance of the presence of multiple realities, right? And if so, it might sound something like this. I am so grateful for the opportunity to have found a partner that reflects back to me aspects of what I truly desire in long-term relationship. And through our interactions together, I've become increasingly aware of an expanding desire for deepening intimacy and soul deep connection with a partner. I've become aware that there is a bigger pie out there. As this desire of mine has expanded, I now come to realize that the essence of what I want may be larger than the containment of our current relationship contract. And while I see the divine spark and potential for who you may become and or for what this relationship could be, if you were perhaps at a different phase in your process, I must acknowledge that I am already at a particular phase in my process. And I must take steps to find creative solutions in order to honor both of our processes and our unique realities, because each one is equally valid and important. If I take your reality as my own, I fail to show up authentically and we will no longer be able to truly connect. And if I attempt to push my reality onto you, I dismiss who you are and we will no longer be able to see or receive each other, which will also mean that we are no longer able to truly connect. That does not serve either of us or our purposes here on earth. I cannot stunt my own growth, keep myself small, or attempt to lower my expectations so as to try to fit into the small box of egoically constructed ideas about what something should be fueled by a fear-based survival need and attachment need. And so now I release my ego attachments and fantasies about who I might want you to be in service of my satisfaction and instead remain open to receiving exactly who you are in this moment. And I embrace the idea that you have a separate reality from mine and that you are the expert on how you are living and experiencing that reality. And I am the expert in how I am living and experiencing my reality. And both of these realities can exist simultaneously with conscious and compassionate communication that acknowledges our contrasts and our differences in experience, values, beliefs, and perspectives. In fact, this contrast is the very thing that adds to the variety and the spice of life. And it stimulates my attraction to you at the same time challenging my assumptions about what is true and even my assumptions about who I am. I surrender to the wisdom of spirit in the universe as it sends to me signs and inklings each and every day throughout my interactions with people and my allowance for sinking into the present moment and a willingness to see people for how they experience themselves in this present moment, even if that is a state of ambivalence, even if that is a state of indecision, even if that is a state of transience or disconnection. I acknowledge that their disconnection from themselves is not a reflection of my worth and value, and it is not my responsibility to solve that for them or to inspire them out of it. Though from a place of abundance and self-knowing, I can offer emotional attunement and a willingness to empathize, support, and be generous again without abandoning myself to inhabit their truth or a dismissing of their truth in order to assert mine over them. As I move through the world in this way, a veil will be pulled away from my eyes. I will come to recognize that fantasy and romanticism are not preferable to this multiverse of unending realities, but rather pale in comparison to this mesmerizingly divine and surprising kaleidoscope. So fantasies and romanticism are constrained by the limits of your ego by what you have experienced so far. But when you open up and you surrender those fantasies and you just allow like this, the possibilities, they are beyond your wildest dreams and they fall within reach. And you recognize that each moment is in fact a miraculous gift and the depths of intimacy are boundless and you get to have it all. <laughs>